I'm coming to our court, I always feel fine, so feel ready to, to fight, you know. I want the whole world to know what's going on in our courts, because it's inhuman. It isn't a trial, it's a lynching party. I'd say that in Russia, around 30% of prisoners are innocent. Victims of fake trials commissioned by their business rivals or by the authorities themselves. In Russia, this is what's known as economic crime. In Russian prisons, they do everything they can to destroy your personality. And when you have a child, this gives them even a stronger hold over you. I was in a model prison where the rules were strictly respected. Except those rules date back to 1937. <laughs> I'm afraid for Russia now. Anyone, even when they're innocent, can find themselves in prison overnight and suffer as we have suffered. In today's Russia, the elected president is no longer cheered by the crowds. He has the streets of Moscow evacuated so that he can parade shielded from his opponents. In today's Russia, the middle class is putting up resistance. At the forefront, businesswomen of character and conviction, ardent activists standing up against the oligarchy and arbitrariness of a compliant judicial system. The court finds Kozlov Alexei Alexandrovich guilty of embezzlement under Article 159 and of attempted money laundering under Article 30. He is sentenced to five years in a general regime penal colony. An ironic smile for a sentence that comes as no surprise to anyone. With a parting look at his wife, Olga Romanova, the businessman, Alexei Kozlov, found guilty of embezzlement, leaves for prison with his bag already packed in preparation for a verdict known in advance. A symbolic trial for all these upholders of a corrupt judicial system. We obtain permission to enter the prison where the deposed trader is being detained. Our guide, journalist Zoya Svetova, daughter of Soviet dissidents, sentenced to the Gulag and member of a prison visiting association. She alone is authorized by the judge to see the prisoner. Kurgan 
Здрасте. 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 Как у вас дела? Все отлично. Все Давно не виделись. На самом деле условия содержания. I have to tell you that the pre-trial detention conditions haven't improved at all. They let you stew for hours, hunched up in a special cell with no light. Сборка, где они сидят, там отсутствует, сказать, освещение. Это вы имеете в виду конвойный? You mean when they bring you to court? Невозможно. That's right. Yes. You can't prepare for your trial properly in these conditions. The last time I spent an hour in there before the trial and five hours after it, not counting travel time. Do they give you something to drink at least? No, nothing. They even refuse to let me have water. Ладно, счастливо вам, спасибо, свидание. The prisoner will soon be transferred to a penal colony 250 kilometers away from Moscow, where the regime is much harsher than in this type of prison here. For the time being, Alexei feels safe. He can go out and exercise and can even take showers for two euros per day. While a shower can be paid for, safety is priceless. Alexei says he's received death threats. We've done some renovating. You can see this one. According to regulations, each prisoner has a space of four square meters, but it's hard to know for sure. The only cell they show us is empty and smells of fresh paint. Do you have any others like this one, but occupied? No, this is the largest one, and we're renovating little by little. Russian law specifies that businessmen are not to be mixed with common law criminals. But in reality, they have to cohabit with dangerous prisoners. The examining magistrate may sometimes ask the prison wardens to place them in a difficult psychological situation, with mentally disturbed prisoners, for example, in order to keep them under pressure so that they'll tell the examining magistrate what he wants to hear. But no one from the prison will ever tell you that. Only the ex-prisoners, once they're out, will tell you about it. And they are numerous. In Russia, one business owner out of six has already been prosecuted for economic crime. Out of the 120,000 presently convicted, 10,000 are believed to be victims of entirely fabricated trials. A year ago, while awaiting his second trial, we met with Alexei Kozlov, who was out of prison, temporarily. At home with Olga, his journalist wife, he was taking advantage of a brief reprieve obtained through a long, hard struggle. The Supreme Court had just overturned his first conviction, but ordered a retrial after three years imprisonment. I know every stone, every gap in this fence. I spend so many long hours waiting there. They remind you of the old concentration camps, but here in Russia, they're still in activity. The businessman takes notes and publishes on his blog every detail of his stay in prison. He says he's the victim of the greed of his ex-business partner, an influential senator who bought the services of a corrupt judge. It's as if the investigators and even the judge sold their services. They work for the government, but sell their power by accepting bribes to put people away in prison. In my case, they were bought by my ex-collaborator. He paid to have this trial set up, and it enabled him to obtain my shares in the company at a much lower price than through legal channels. I was a lot less naive than my husband. For over a year, I kept telling him, leave the country. Sooner or later, you'll be arrested too. Because as an economic journalist, I knew about 50 or so businessmen who'd found themselves imprisoned overnight after fabricated trials. Deep down, I was prepared. But what's really shocking is that there aren't just 50, 100, or even 5,000 of them, but many, many more. These fabricated trials are ravaging the entire country. Here's our calendar. On each page, a different case. And a woman left behind, sometimes with several children in her care. 
It's to defend their rights that Olga founded the movement Russia Behind Bars. That's a woman from Kirov. The regional governor put her husband in prison. He ran a pasta factory. Such are the devastating effects of a judicial system that sells itself to the highest bidder. But in Russia, there is an even more radical way of designating a guilty party, with the order coming directly from above. Maria Baranova, an angelic face threatened by the political legal machinery. A new Vladimir Putin opposition figure, she is under investigation for inciting a riot. Her error is having demonstrated against the new president's inauguration on May 6 last year. She faces two years in prison. Hi, I'm running a bit late, sorry. Where do I have to go now? To the podium or to Pushkin Square? But she plans on going out to demonstrate again today. Okay, I've got it. I'll hurry up. Bye. What do you risk by going out to demonstrate? I don't know. I don't want to think about it. My lawyer just called to warn me. He said, don't go, for whatever reason. You can't afford to get arrested. I'm picking out some magazines just in case. If I'm arrested, I'll spend hours at the police station. I need something to pass the time. So, where's my charger? Now placed under judicial supervision, the former parliamentary assistant no longer has the right to leave Moscow, where she's raising her five-year-old son alone. She's still traumatized by the forceful raid on her apartment last June. Of course I felt aggressed. It was as though I'd committed an act of terrorism. A group of men come to your apartment armed with Kalashnikovs and an electric saw to cut open your door? Fortunately, the babysitter was alone. My son was at his grandmother's house in the country. Then the child protection inspectors came. They threatened to take my son away. Government employees who had voted for Putin, no doubt. But they got a surprise. They saw that I had a conventional apartment with IKEA furniture. I'm nothing like the dropout they were expecting. Attacking me is like attacking the whole IKEA generation, the entire middle class. I received a lot of support. That Saturday, a large section of this IKEA generation met up for the March of the Millions. The middle class in Pushkin Square against Putin. Eight thousand policemen have been mobilized to oversee the demonstration. And amongst the protesters, even the absent are present. It's very symbolic. They represent all the people who were arrested last time. Today they're demonstrating alongside us just the same. Out of the 14,000 demonstrators present that day, liberals, nationals and communists walk side by side, with a shared sentiment. Distrust of Putin, he who had nonetheless managed to win them over during his first term of office in the early 2000s. I'm a representative model of the Putin generation. I even supported him 100%. But after a while, I realized he was deceiving us. Take Stalin, for example. He was a dictator, but he didn't own anything other than his boots and his overcoat. He believed in his repressive system. He was even convinced that the totalitarian regime would strengthen the country. Our present ruling power, him, has only one aim, lining his own pockets. And for that, he uses repression. In the spring, in order to gag the opposition, Vladimir Putin had a series of repressive laws passed. The fine for breach of peace was multiplied by 200, one million rubles, three and a half times the average annual salary. But not enough to dissuade the Russian craftsmen, executives and business owners to begin what they call their bourgeois revolution. We have money to spend in cafes. We buy high-tech products. I too have a brand new car. 
It's not our material well-being that preoccupies us. It's our right to fair justice. Because they can confiscate your business at any moment. They just need to fabricate charges, hold a fake trial. On a simple request from an oligarch, for example, you can find yourself stripped of everything you own. Refusal to accept the arbitrariness and corruption that have spread out from the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin, twice president, once prime minister, then president again since March 4th of last year after amending the Constitution. I ask you the question, are we going to win? And we won. A drift toward authoritarianism that has awakened new consciences with simple bloggers now sometimes becoming leading political activists. If we overthrow Putin, it'll represent a personal loss for him of millions of dollars. Our victory will mean for him and his gang the loss of a yacht, a mistress, or a villa on the French Riviera. They will no longer be able to appoint their children as heads of the leading banks and state companies, nor enrich themselves through corruption. That day, in the sky above Sakharov Avenue, three balaclava helmets floated above the demonstrators. Three brightly colored balaclavas, now world famous. We've been fighting for the right to sing, to think, to criticize. Pussy Riot isn't just a music band, but a collective of feminist punk artists, a subversive vanguard of the anti-Putin movement. Two years in prison. That's the sentence received by three Pussy Riot members last August. Sentence upheld on appeal for two of them. Since then, the 20 or so other members of the collective have gone underground. <laughs> Wanted by the police, they communicate solely via coded messages and systematically switch off their phones for each new protest action. This action was carried out by two participants who've left the country. It was a hard decision for them to leave, but each one made her choice. They felt they would be more useful abroad, where they can contribute to write their texts and music and send them to us. As long as there are no judicial and penitentiary systems worthy of the name in Russia, we can't afford to place members of our group in danger. For its anti-Putin prayer on February 21st last year, judged profane, the group chose the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, Moscow's largest church, a stone's throw away from the Kremlin. Are you proud of this protest action despite the consequences? There was a feminist dimension to this action. We chose to perform on the altar, a place where women aren't allowed in the Orthodox Church. But it's also a punk action, and the Cathedral of Christ the Savior was the ideal place for this. So in this respect, it was Pussy Riot's best performance, a huge success. The protest action mobilized huge support in the West but remains largely misunderstood by the majority of conservative-minded Russians. Amongst the protesters of a trial worthy of the Inquisition, Nadia's husband, Piotr Versilov, a 26-year-old rebel artist and inspiring force behind the group. The judge violated all the established rules. He refused to satisfy the demands of our lawyers and refused to interview our witnesses. 
The girls were detained in the hearing room with no break and with hardly any food from 9 a.m. until after 10 p.m. every day. With this trial, the entire world saw that there exists not even a semblance of justice in Russia. But the vast majority still supports Putin? Perhaps. But remember back in 1937, during the worst moments of the Stalinist repression, when they arrested and executed thousands of people for no reason, the majority of the population also supported the sentences and executions. Pyotr Versilov, a child of the 80s, grew up in post-Soviet Russia, lulled by the economic boom of the 2000s. An average growth of 7%. Household income increased by 15% per year for almost a decade. The emergence of a middle class with both consumerist and democratic dreams. Today it makes up one third of the population and demands its share of political and economic influence. But the oligarchy is putting up resistance. In an outlying district of East Moscow, a businesswoman, financial manager of a chemical import company, found this out the hard way. Yana Yakovleva spent eight months behind bars in 2007. Victim, she says, of the mafia, or rather, of bureaucracy. Today, she advises company managers who find themselves up against the same system. <laughs> this is a thank you letter from the manager of a large dairy company in the Kostroma region. He spent two years in prison for fraud. Company owners think they're building a market economy. I was convinced that because I'd always respected the law and worked hard, my business was going to be prosperous and I'd make a lot of money. That was my aim. I wasn't aware of the other system that continued to exist in parallel, a system that hasn't changed since 1937, the sole aim of which is to steal our business and money while protecting the interests of corrupt officials. Freedom Day. That was the slogan of the demonstration in Pushkin Square, where my collaborators demanded my release. To symbolize chemicals, they beat on those blue metal drums. That was in November 2007, in Moscow city center. On the stand, Yana's father, Viktor. If we don't manage to get Yana Yakovlava freed, the repression will affect hundreds of other chemical companies throughout the country. It was the first time in Russia that a demonstration was organized to demand the release of a business owner. Victor remembers the day the troubles began for his daughter's business. The day when officers of the anti-drug police made her an offer, an offer she couldn't refuse. This is where we stock part of our sample. These officers came and told us they were going to offer us a lucrative deal. They said the drug producers in Tajikistan and Afghanistan need your thinners. We'll give you the names of the buyer companies, and in return, we'll give you complete protection. You'll have no more competitors. A lot of companies accept this sort of mafia-type deal. But Yana refused categorically, and a few days later she was arrested. Thanks to public mobilization, the charges against Yana were eventually dropped. She got her company back, but grieves the loss of an independent Russian judicial system. 
Но вообще нет, это мне просто подарили, как поняли. I was given this gavel as a symbol of justice. In theory, it symbolizes the judge. Стать суд идет. But the symbol only has value in your country, in the West, in the United States. In Russia, the symbol of justice isn't the gavel, but the USB key. The prosecutor's USB key. The one that is handed to the judge at the time of the verdict for him to slip into his computer and read a sentence written in advance. That's the whole difference between our two systems. Our symbol isn't the gavel, it's the USB key. A remote-controlled, ruthless gavel. In Russia, 99% of trials result in a prison sentence. More even than under Stalin. Fifteen hundred kilometers away, on the edge of the steppes, lies the Republic of Bashkir, one of the most productive of the Federation. It's in Ufa, the capital city, that Masha, a 41-year-old mother, had set up her small business. So this was your former real estate agency? Yes. And nothing has changed, in fact, except that it's now a store. It employed over 40 people at the time. The employees enjoyed working here. It was very popular. Masha never found out who had wanted to harm her. She suspected a jealous competitor or corrupt officials who may have bribed a judge to mount a fake investigation against her and take over her business, which had become too profitable. In my case, it was very clear. I was told from the beginning that if I gave the examining magistrate $30,000, the case would be dropped. The lawyers advised me to do it, but I didn't have that amount of money. As a result, my agency was badmouthed in the local press, my business was destroyed. They spread the word that I was a crook. Several attempts to intimidate her employees, and soon afterwards, her arrest, under Article 159 of the Penal Code, fraud. You can see it clearly. That's the remand prison. I was first placed in a cell, a cage with metal bars. In theory, they're not allowed to detain pregnant women. There wasn't even enough room to lie down. But somebody had probably given them instructions to torture me a bit more. According to Russian law, pregnant women have the right to request a deferment of sentence. But the judge wouldn't grant her this opportunity. Despite being four months pregnant, Masha was sent to a penal colony for two years. A train for Siberia, which still remains, the Gulag Archipelago, the destination of hundreds of thousands of prisoners in Russia, the lost land of the new outcasts of the system. Stalin's prisons, have become Putin's prisons. There, that's my camp. Camp number five, where I spent two years. The penal colony, in other words, a labor camp for prisoners serving long sentences. After some tough negotiating with the prison administration, we obtained special authorization to return with the ex-prisoner to the site of her ordeal. It's the same thing for all the 47,000 women prisoners in Russia. 10 hours work per day in front of a sewing machine. 
They make the shirts of the policemen and prison guards' uniforms. They've come full circle with a wage of half a euro per day, which pays for their food. The hardest part of prison life is the psychological distress. Work, even the most repetitive task, helps. When your hands are busy, you drift less into depression. Those are the winter uniforms, compulsory skirt. And those are the summer clothes. Masha, together with 90 other women, spent two years in this special facility, an open dormitory cell where privacy is erased under the burden of rules. That's for measuring, you see. All the beds have to be made up like this, down to the last millimeter. You have to stand at the side of it every morning. No room here for personal effects, but to remind these special prisoners that they are also mothers, a disturbing picture. A painting of a woman in tears holding her child in her arms. Masha gave birth within these walls, watched by the prison guards. A birth, a separation, because the babies are kept apart in a facility at the other side of the camp. Once in the morning and once in the evening, these women prisoners become mothers again, despite the uniform, during these two brief visits per day. When the gray harshness of prison life takes on the colors of a rainbow. Now living in Moscow since her release from prison, Masha places her prison experience at the service of the association, Russia Behind Bars. Here people are called by number, that of the article of the penal code under which they were sentenced. We classify the victims' files so that we know who's there, the lawyers, the victims, and under which article they were sentenced. Are there a lot of new faces? Yes, there are, unfortunately. As its symbol, the association has chosen to misappropriate Russia's two-headed eagle, half policeman, half prisoner. My husband got nine and a half years for drug trafficking. That was a classic, and it was all fabricated. Yes, there were no drugs. It was the cops who put the drugs in his car trunk. That evening, the association is speaking live on the Internet, the only place of freedom outside the padlocks of official television. Please give a round of applause for Victor. For a long time, our only husband, the only one who fulfilled his role and supported his wife in prison. Normally, it's just mothers, wives, and sisters who join us. Thanks to the efforts of the association, 15 or so people have been released. Very few, given the 6,000 cases presently being followed. It's the moment for the long-awaited hearing, one that Tina Kankia has also been dreading. She's finally going to have the opportunity to see her husband imprisoned for the past two years for smuggling. In the courthouse corridor, the reassuring smile of another husband, just released from prison. He's here to support her. But finally, there'll be no hearing this morning and no husband. The judge has taken off, is that it? She doesn't want my husband to be filmed and his state of health revealed? Look, the cell's empty, but I'm sure my husband's in the building. They're not letting him into the courtroom to prevent us from filming him because he was in good health before they did that to him. 
They tortured a sick man with handcuffs and gave him injections to calm him down. At each hearing, he says he's in pain. He shows them his hands that are completely blue, and nobody does anything about it, neither the judge nor the prosecutor. They have no pity whatsoever, and all this for so-called economic fraud. It's not a violent crime. Tina's anger toward the judge is provoked by the jackboot trial she presides over. After several strokes, her husband's health has deteriorated in prison. Tina has lost all illusion and hopes of a fair judicial system in her country. But she has kept secret recordings of each of his appearances in court as pieces of evidence. That's me. Now they're beating him. You can see, he was in good health before. He was very athletic. He was even an underwater diving champion in his younger days. Now he weighs 20 kilos less, and he was slim to begin with, so you can imagine. Eyes protruding like this. Under the strain of the situation, the family split up. Tina's two daughters live apart from her now. The eldest one is studying in the United States thanks to a scholarship. Ariane, the youngest, for her protection, is living with her grandmother. 200 kilometers away from Moscow. Exactly one month before the last presidential elections in February 2012, a ray of hope nevertheless flickered. In a temperature of minus 17, Olga's combat took a very political turn. Over 100,000 Russians are expected to turn out, spurred on by the increasing growth of public mobilization since early December. Are all the members present, Olga? Just the ones who don't mind the cold, the most zealous activists, let's say. The members of Russia Behind Bars have joined the ranks of a heterogeneous opposition movement. On the frozen banks of the Moskva River, their slogan is, a fair Russia and without Putin. Russia без Putin! Russia без Putin! Olga is one of the key figures of the Voters League. As an organizer of the march, she uses the stage to force open the gates of power. We're going to take a list of names to the Kremlin. Police, let us through, please. Freedom for all the unfairly sentenced. Putin is a louse. Four days later, she's achieved her aim. She's received by the Kremlin administration. So this is the big day? Yes, I'm late. I have the list of political prisoners. It's time to go. An incongruous moment for the activist who puts insults to one side for a very official appointment with one of the president's advisors. 
ready to defend her 34 prisoners, doctors, teachers, economists, and business owners. She receives a surprisingly warm welcome. There's the case of the physicist Danilov, for example. Yes, I've discussed this case with the president. There are effectively 100,000 business owners detained in prison. That's the equivalent of a large town. They could be participating in our country's development. 100,000 people who could create employment if they were amnestied. Yes, but you know no judge has ever been convicted for unfair sentencing. Asking for amnesty is one thing. Obviously, the entrepreneurs shouldn't be imprisoned. But it's also essential that the criminals wearing uniforms and judges' gowns be made responsible for their acts and be punished. Because at that time, Dmitry Medvedev hasn't yet ceded his throne to his friend Putin. He shows a willingness to want to alleviate penal repression for businessmen. No more prison sentences for tax fraud, for example, officially. You know, Medvedev has already done a lot of things in favor of business owners. He's adapted the penal code. There's been a beginning of liberalization. The president told me one day, I've done more in this direction than all my predecessors put together. I hope the next president will continue along the same path. Two months later, the Kremlin announced the release of Sergei Montnakin, the only one on the list of 34 names to be pardoned. Давайте я с краешку все-таки не в срединку, у меня какие-то плохие ассоциации с этим. Да. Now free, Masha still remains haunted, traumatized by the memory of this prison nursery. Twice a day, at permitted hours only, she would come and breastfeed her son, who spent the rest of the time in the care of prison guards. Here's where the prisoners breastfeed. And there? You can go in. They're all there. They're sleeping. As a general rule, the mothers are allowed to see their baby for two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening, at a time when the children are awake and are available for them. She's smiling already, you see. She stopped crying. She's our little doll. How can we not love her? A heartbreaking sight for Masha, these replacement mothers in uniform. It was terrible. After the transfer, for example, because of the stress, I couldn't draw my milk anymore. They took advantage of that to place me in quarantine, saying I wasn't a good mother. They wouldn't let me see him for a month. A month during which I saw just a glimpse of him now and then, thanks to a cellmate, I remember, who'd hold Vadim up to the window so I could see him. At the age of three, the children leave the camp permanently to be placed in an orphanage. So Masha had but one obsession, being released from prison in time, not to lose Vadim. She did everything she could to obtain a parole and finally managed to leave the camp, her child in her arms, with only 19 euros and a third-class train ticket in her pocket. She lost custody of her two eldest sons, who live with their father, who's since remarried. Her life's in shatters, but despite everything, Masha feels fortunate. She escaped from the Siberian archipelago. It's easy for them to manipulate the mothers, those with young infants, but also those who have children on the outside. 
обычными женщинами, у которых нет детей, манипулируют точно так же теми детьми, которые на, на воле. It's a means of blackmail. They say to us, if you don't behave well, you won't have your sentence reduced. One of my cellmates found her child dead. He was sick, and they had him sleep on his stomach. She was devastated. But no action was taken. There was no inquiry. To calm her down, they gave her psychoactive medication, telling her it was a case of caught death. А в соседнем доме на крыльцо то выходила, то обратно уходила молодая единоногая, то стадиком, то щеником, то стадиком, то щеником Марина. А я сидел и думал, да чего? Once out of prison, Яна also had to rebuild her life again, start a new family. Да чего же моя жизнь легка над белым небом, над черным небом? She still continues her fight against corruption, at present via Business Solidarity, the association she founded. Here she is in North Caucasus for a suspected case of unfair arrest in the town of Astrakhan. This region at the mouth of the Volga River made its fortune from gas and caviar. Yana is going to act as mediator in the VIP lounge of the local hotel. On one side, representatives of the public prosecutor. On the other, the wife of a building contractor sentenced to seven years in prison. Before his arrest, this contractor wrote to me, I quote, In my town, in the space of just a few months, the construction business has been totally destroyed. Out of 19 companies, only three are left. Three other managers have been imprisoned in the same way. This woman's husband presents himself as the victim of a local government official who decided to go into the construction business and eliminate all his competitors. Is it common for wives to speak out in their husband's defense? Yes, it is. In any case, for the business owners to stand any chance of being saved, it's through their wives, never through the legal system. They're the ones who fight to get things moving. It's like the story of the frog who falls into the pot of milk. It struggles and struggles, paddling its legs so as not to drown. And the milk finally turns into butter, and he gets free. The young woman doesn't know it yet, but her husband will be released two months later. A fragile ray of sunshine in an interminable winter. In search of a brighter future, 53% of Russian business owners now envisage leaving the country. Yana Yakovleva doesn't define herself as an activist, but for the opening of this political art exhibition, she counts herself amongst the members of the opposition group Russian Visionaries, the name of the exhibition. Do you like this photo? Yes. Although they could have touched it up a bit. It's a bit too true to life there. I'd like to look a bit younger. I'm lacking youth. But just look at these intelligent eyes. 
At the heart of the project is Elena. She's the ex-wife of the only opposition leader photographed behind bars. Mikhail Khodovkovsky, sentenced to 13 years in prison for tax fraud and nicknamed Putin's prisoner. Lyudmila Alexeva has disobedience in her blood. The ex-Soviet dissident has taken on the role of sponsor. It's she who advised Yana to defend the cause of the business owners. Yes, I've been speaking out about it since the end of the 90s. In Russia, the business owners have become a risk group. Our country is very strange. Elsewhere, it's aid sufferers or the handicapped, but in our country, it's businessmen. Yana was the first to begin the fight. With Olga Ramanova, they're like two little birds straight out of my nest. Olga has also posed for the camera, an opportunity to meet up with a friend. The cuckoo sings the praises of the cock because the cock sang the praises of the cuckoo. Is that it? <laughs> They're going to look at your portrait now. The two women met in 2008, just after Alexei's first arrest. I was told that Yana could understand me, but instead of showing compassion, she gave me a big kick on the butt. <laughs> She said, move, do something, fight. I said to myself, what a bitch. Now, I'm the one who says the same thing to these women with wounded hearts, who find themselves all alone with their children. If you want to see your husband again, get up off your butt. Move, fight. I'm not going to do it for you. With their implacable scrutiny of Vladimir Putin's regime, these women and men dream with eyes wide open of the birth of a new Russia one day.